Hello everybody, Jessica Henry here. I'm so happy to have you back today in my studio. I have something kind of fun and what I thought I would do today uh, is just a little bit of watercolor painting. A lot of people ask questions about uh, watercolor and they want to see more of it and I thought, you know, let's do this. We're in the holiday season now and I know people get busy and sometimes it's hard to find the time to just get away in your studio. And one of the things that I personally love so much about watercolor is the cleanup. It's so easy. You can walk away from your palette, your brushes, everything. Just rinse out your brushes in the water, set everything down, go make dinner, whatever. You're just so um, not committed like a big oil painting and I love that. Um, so I thought let's do a fun refreshing little watercolor and I'll get into more about what we're gonna do here in a little bit. But I also wanted to um, talk about in our academy with the Renaissance we have we're getting into some of the First year students are doing some more of the watercolors and I thought it'd be fun to just really feature that uh, today too. So um, if you're not a part of the Renaissance community or you're interested in it, I'll put a link down below. I want to tell you before I get going on this, I have some very exciting plans for the month of December. For the next three weeks, not coming today, not, not this lesson today, but um, for the month of December, I just want to really show my appreciation and gratitude for all of the support that you guys have given me. And um, I love your comments, your likes, your shares. It's incredible and phenomenal. I want to give away um, a painting every week, three weeks, so, uh, the 7th, the 21st, and the 28th. So I am going to be drawing a name um, of somebody if you are a subscriber. So subscribe to my channel if you want to be included. Um, and I may draw more than one name. If you comment in the section below, then you are entered to win. So I will know that if you comment um, in the next three lessons, um, you can comment on this one too, but that um, you are a subscriber to my channel and I'm happy to draw a name at random and I might draw more than one name, whatever. I've got, I'm up to my ears in demos and paintings that I've done in the whole year and I thought, you know what? let's give the stuff away. I'm super excited too and I know that you guys have been supportive and if you want to give it as a gift or just keep it your, for yourself you can do that whatever you want to do with them. Um, so that is my plan for December and if you're part of our Renaissance community I'm drawing a name or more in that community and if you follow me on Facebook I'm drawing a name or more in that community. So if you follow and you're a part of all of these different venues in um, what I do you might win. <laughs> you might win big. So I'm just saying, um, let's let's do this, and um, we're going to have a lot of fun, and I'm excited about that. So let's jump into our lesson today. Uh, what I want to do is I'm going to just spend a lot of time kind of talking. I've got all this stuff out. We're going to have a lot of fun with this. Um, but my lesson for today is I'm going to show you how to do a cute little um, a watercolor postcard greeting card that you can send these out. I'm going to include down below a PDF of just some really simple drawings uh, that you can do on these. I don't care if you take the drawing, transfer it onto watercolor paper, whatever you want to do, it's fine. But I'll show you how to do all that in a little bit. Um, so I'm going to talk about Victorian watercolor and that is something that I like to teach. Uh, next summer, excuse me, July, I am teaching a workshop in the south of England. Um, we're going to be doing, it's a three-day workshop in Victorian watercolor. I can't believe I'm going to England to teach Victorian watercolor. I'm out of my mind excited. Okay, so if you want more information on that workshop, link's down below. And that is an all-inclusive workshop. So, like, you get yourself there, the rest is taken care of for you. The beautiful, um, she's shown me her bed and breakfast, the, all the meals are taken care of like top quality and it's right on the beach okay so like you've got she showed me the pictures of the cliffs and, uh, and it's in Dorset England so if you want to google it look it up or I'll put the link down below and you get more information so Victorian watercolor love it uh, that is it's, it's a method that I paint in that I have found that is so much easier it really does take a lot of the intimidation out of watercolor painting and if I think if more people realized how very easy and fun and refreshing it is, more people would do it. I think that what happens with watercolor is we just get overwhelmed and it just kind of gets rubbed out, overworked, scratchy, and it, it doesn't look like what we want it to look like because I think we see a lot of videos and things where it's splashy and kind of fun and exciting, but then it gets out of control. And so I want to show you how to just manage that control and paint beautiful pictures. So we're going to play with some salt today and I've got even a little bit of white acrylic paint. We're gonna do some snow because we're gonna do a little bit of Christmassy scene, whatever. So, um, 
let's get in. I'm going to leave the camera right here for a minute because I'm going to talk to you about some of my Victorian watercolors that I have done as well as um, some books that you can, well I just have one book here handy with me right now. I think my kids took my Beatrix Potter book. But, <laughs> uh, anyway, Beatrix Potter, Blanche Fisher, right? The, she did the Mother Goose pictures. Iconic Victorian watercolor, very controlled washes, just layering color on color to get certain effects. Um, the Edwardian Lady, uh, this is Edith Holden, that might be backwards for you, but um, nature notes of an Edwardian Lady, Edith Holden, she was one of the, um, one of these ladies back in England, and she just did these gorgeous um, little watercolors, filled notebooks with just nature studies of, you know, nature up close, leaves, flowers, um, you know, things, things of this nature, little birds. I did a copy of one of her paintings once, and you can learn so much just by standing on the shoulders of giants, isn't that the proverbial saying? <laughs> and um, I have that copy right here, and I will show you it. This one I did uh, years ago, but it was helpful in just kind of learning this, this balance and composition. I loved how she put the nest over here, and the bird and lit points you back this way, and there's, um, I don't know if you can see, little tiny horses plowing this field. And look at how this composition of this branch and the little blossoms just points you right back down. How beautiful is that composition? Okay, so this was a, a painting I did, a, a master copy of one of Edith Holden's watercolors. So obviously, you know, you don't want to sell these or anything, but they're good studies. So um, what I've done is I've illustrated uh, all kinds of uh, pictures and um, been doing this for uh, 20 four years watercolor painting. I mean, I did it when I was a kid, but I didn't really know what I was doing. So when I really got um, educated and started teaching it in 1994, that's when things really started taking off because up until that point, uh, I was struggling too. I couldn't really manage the watercolors and it was confusing and so I, I just didn't do it. But So I will show you some of my Victorian watercolors. I'm going to breeze through these kind of quickly because there's a lot, and I think it's fun. So I started illustrating a Tolkien book. I did 26 illustrations, and um, I sent it to the publishing company, and they said, wow, we love them, but we already have our in-house illustrator, so I'm going to keep pushing this door. But it's a story about a little doggy, Rover Random, this little dog, and this is a wizard, and uh, maybe I'll publish these someday, but these are Victorian watercolors. And someone asked me, what sets Victorian watercolors apart from other watercolors? And I, I believe it's in the methods that they were doing back in the Victorian times, and that is how I was taught to layer, um, and I know we layer in regular watercolor painting, but there's there's just a more controlled environment. I draw the picture onto my watercolor paper in, in all the detail that I want, that, that I'm, I take a long time on the drawing, and, um, and then I just build it up in layers. This was a super easy one. Um, for, it's all part of the Rover Random story. He gets his wings and stuff like that. It's really cute. But this is just a simple, you can see it's just a very light wash of blue with just a few things of the, you know, the darker spots on the doggy. And then I pen and ink it. And I'll show you how I pen and ink in a little bit. Um, this is, these are all still from the same story. They're on the moon here. They go up to the moon. And um, I, I can't show you today how I do all those little flowers, but if you guys like these watercolor videos, I can do more. I love watercolor. It's one of my favorites. Um, but, uh, oh, and then he goes under the sea, the wizard does, and the little doggy. He marries the mer queen, or the mer princess. And so it's really, it's cute. <laughs> I think that's, yeah, I put the, oh, here's a big one. Also from that story, there's the mer palace. So what I can talk about a little bit too is building up these darks and building up more complex pictures like this and um, just seeing how to, to kind of develop something like that. Let me get these out of the way. And then I've got a few just simpler ones. These I did, oh gosh, back in 1999, 20 years ago. These were my two cats and my dog. But I kind of wanted to show you some simpler things like that today. Um, oh, I have one more from Rover Random. They mess with the white dragon on the shadowed side of the moon and, you know, chaos ensues. <laughs> So that's a lot of pen and inking on there. I don't know if you can see that very well. I've got a shadow on my screen. But um, that's, that's him. And the little dog's getting in big trouble. Let me get these out of here. 
And then um, this one I did in 1994 or three when I was just learning how to do um, Victorian watercolor. And this is also a master copy. Um, and I didn't write who the original artist was on here. I wish I had. I don't think it was Jesse Wilcox Smith, but it, it looks like it, but I don't know. So um, it probably isn't. But, um, but yeah, so what I did to learn how to do this is I took the picture that I had as reference and I transferred it onto this watercolor paper. And the reason I don't mind transferring for this purpose is only for the purpose of learning. Um, none of my other paintings, watercolor or oils, are transferred or projected. I absolutely am against that 110%. It, it actually sickens me when I find out that artists I really respect are projecting. It's, it's, to me, it's cheating. <laughs> uh, so, but for this case, when we're learning um, a technique, and it isn't something where, I mean, you're just giving him his gifts or whatever. I don't care if you transfer. So I'm, in the PDF, you know, I'll just include some drawings and you can play with them. And then this one I did, uh, it's a little bit more realistic. Sort of in keeping with the, the style of Victorian. Um, it's a lot of what you don't paint that stays the white of the canvas. and Or pa canvas, paper. <laughs> and then just working the layers this way so that they stay light. All right, so that is that, and I'm going to bring you up a little bit closer to my table so you can see all of this mess here. Okay, so down here, um, we've got kind of a bird's eye view of my desk, and I will show you. This is just, this is a drafting table, and it actually has a glass surface under here, but I put this large sheet of just heavy plastic on it so that it doesn't glare when I do the filming. Um, all right, so I am going to show you all of these things that I have here. And I'll talk about them. So to get yourself set up for watercolor, I strongly suggest um, a good quality paper. It is not something that you want to skimp on. You don't have to buy um, you don't have to buy the fancy arches right away. I had this pack of watercolors. I think that this whole paper was um, twelve dollars, and it's it's actually fine. I think it's um, 140 pound hot press. And what that means is on a block of um, paper, and I forget how many is in a block, seriously I forget every single time, um, a certain amount of blocks of paper weighs 140 pounds. If you have the really thick paper that is, oh I'm, actually none of these are 300 pound examples, 300 pound is my favorite watercolor paper to work with and that is really thick, actually I do have some right here. This, you can see, it's almost cardboard, and that is 300 pound cold pressed. Okay, so, and then you can get 90 pound, these are 140, but 90 pound I do not recommend for watercolor painting because it's too thin and it'll ripple. So 300 pound, uh, that's what that means. And then um, the hot press, cold pressed, and rough. Rough I find extremely uh, difficult to paint on because you've got all these big toothy things in the surface of the paper, and if you like that, great. Um, most people, I think, find that difficult to paint on. A lot of people choose cold press, and cold press has a little bit of a tooth to the surface. Well, not a little bit. I mean, it's kind of like, I don't know if you can see that very well. There you go. It has some texture, and um, it's it, that's okay. I'm going to be demonstrating on cold press today. So this is Arches. Um, you can buy these. I think this one... I don't remember. Anyway, so, and then this one is the a little bit larger, um, 9 by 12. This is hot pressed, okay? So look at the surface of that now by comparison. There's like almost no sur uh, tooth on it. And I like that too when I want to do something really detailed. So all of those Rover Random pictures, the watercolor paintings, were all on hot pressed. And I like that a lot for that because... Like I said, you can get more detail. Okay, so I'm going to show you some more of this. We're going to work on this today, actually. I have um, a simple little drawing I did. These are really cute, and this is, this is what I'm going to talk about today. Doing these cute little postcards on the back of these postcards. There's a place for you to fill in your address and stamp and everything. And on the front, you do a cute little whatever, whatever you want. So in the PDF file, I'm going to give you a few drawings. Um, this one... 
and some others, just little snowmen or whatever, that you can transfer onto your paperwork. This is our project for today. So we're going to set that aside for now, and I'll talk about the rest of the materials. Uh, these were some washes I did in another video, and I didn't take these off the board because I just wanted to show you them real quick. A lot of times when we refer to washes, it's just one thin layer. And I have two squares here. I'm going to show you how I do some washes, and then I'm going to demonstrate just a little bit in between and show you a little bit more um, like how to maneuver the puddles and what that means. Over here, these are just layers and layers of um, different pigments. So you can get it pretty bright. If it's still not bright enough for you, let it dry and do another layer over the top. That's what I did with this one, this bright blue. And, um, and then I can show you how to mix colors too. Okay, so we're going to set this aside for now. And then one of the things I love about watercolor painting is its portability. It is so easy to take everything with you. I have a little tiny backpack that all of these things, just a little pad of paper, this roll of brushes, my palette over here, and then my little scrunchable water container. You can throw a water bottle in your bag and then pour a little bit in here. When you're done painting, dump it out. Um, this is a natural sponge. I use this when I'm traveling instead of a paper towel. You can get, use a paper towel too. But this thing I really like, um, you've probably seen them in art stores. They roll up like this, and that is just, I like the softness. Everything that I can scrunch down for my bags is better, especially for travel, because hard-cased um, things take up space because they have air in there, and you don't need those that extra space. So everything's soft-sided. And there's a little pocket over here, I like that. Um, some of these brushes are too long for this case, but that's okay, whatever. Um, I like that you can protect your nice sables. I've got a few sables in here. I'm going to actually take these out as I talk about them because I really want to go over this with you guys. So this is a mop and you can use this kind or you can use a flat. Uh, I don't mind if they're synthetic, but just as long as you are able to hold a lot of water in here because sometimes you work on a larger sheet of paper. So I'm going to put these in my, got my little containers here. I'm going to put them in here as I pull them out. These two brushes are for sumi painting, and I like to keep them on hand because um, once in a while I do sumi painting, and they give you just a nice um, kind of the way that they flick when they're wet. Inside here, this is all natural, but inside there are some stiffer bristles, and then there's some softer bristles, so it has just a nice point and a little bit of a firmness inside. You need two different sizes. Then I've got a little flat, uh, just a wash brush, that is synthetic. Okay, so this is a Kalinske sable, and I'm going to be using some of this to this one today. Maybe maybe a few others for the washes. One of the reasons why people really love Kalinske sables is because um, of the way that the fibers curve on each other, and inside the capacity of one of these, it can hold a lot of water and pigment. And with watercolor painting, it's a timing thing. So if you have to keep going back to your palette to get more paint and water, your painting has time to dry. So if you have a brush that holds a lot more pigment and paint, you can do more with your wash without having to go back so many times. So that's why people prefer the Kalinske Sable. Plus, the actual hairs themselves are taken from the underside of a Kalinske tail and um, they are slightly curved, so they taper, and they have, if you can see it under a microscope, they have um, a point at the end of the bristles, and um, so that, that gives you that natural point, so when you get it wet, it has a really nice sharp point. Um, you also get good spring. Um, there's other um, natural bristles, mongoose and squirrel and so forth. I don't prefer squirrel because I find that when it's wet, it tends to be too soft for me. What I like about sables is that they have a little bit more stiffness. And you're going to pay a heftier price for sable, but if you just have a few, I only have a couple, it, it helps. Um, this one is synthetic. It's just around. It's super cheap. Um, a lot of these just came you know, from the Walmart packs. Believe it or not, I use them often. Um, same kind of thing. Synthetic. What you want to look for in a brush, too, by um, you can tell a little bit better quality, is this is the Furel, 
and look for this on your oil painting brushes too. Look, look at the difference in these two brushes. Do you see the silver one? Has more of a solid crimping down here. When they manufacture this, they crimp it harder on good quality brushes. Look at this cheap one right here. Look at how bad they did crimping that. It's like just, it's almost just decorative. I don't even know. I could, the reason why it's important is I could just basically pull the whole furrow off the brush or in a matter of a few uses, that's gonna fall apart. So you pay for what you get. And this one was a little bit pricier. It's just a more of an individual purchase. Even the, this expensive sable, this has a much deeper crimp even than this. So you, you know, you wanna look for things like that. I was looking at brushes the other day at the store and I saw they had some individual ones and I pulled it out of the, the little container to look at it and the whole thing came apart. I thought, mm, not buying that. Um, so, little guys, sometimes these are fun for scrubbing out, sort of like eraser. And I'll talk more about what it means to sort of erase. And the Victorians did do some of that. Not very much, but they did. And they didn't use mascoid either. So I don't, I don't use mascoid. I try to keep what I do more in keeping with what they did. This brush has seen better days. These are new. I just bought these, so I'd like to try them out. And they have a really nice feel to the wood here. It's, it's got that satiny finish. But I'll leave that one out. And then um, these are getting smaller. These look like I should probably throw them away. See when they start to kind of fray like that? No amount of getting them wet is gonna fix it. I do know that you can dip them in a mixture of milk and sugar and kind of point, make them a better point and leave them to dry overnight and then wash them again the next day and that may reshape them. I haven't bothered with that because whatever. These two itty bitty teeny 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 brushes, okay, this size, this red one is a three over zero. This black one is a 10 over zero. So these are really small. And the reason I have these is because uh, when I get talking about the inking, this is how I ink. I, I prefer to use brushes in that. So I'm gonna get this out of here and move all that over. Um, I keep a sketchbook in my stuff. I always have sketches and or um, a means of taking notes and ideas when I wanna work on something. Just things to think about. Um, these are thumbnail sketches from oil paintings I did. So just keep something. I like this size too. Uh, I found this at the art store. Uh, what is this? Um, 5.8 by 8.25. I like it and um, so you can come up with your thumbnail sketches for those things. I'm not going to use that today because I already have the drawing laid out. Um, pigments. So okay so then um, my palette. So I'm going to hold this up a little bit so you can see it better. I used to have written on here the names of the paint and I do that when I take when I'm giving a class on watercolor because it helps people to have that visual of what color am I getting in? <laughs> Um, and so I do have more colors on here than I normally keep in my day-to-day um, -day oil painting palette because I just I like to take um, secondary colors and mix them with combinations of the other colors and just to neutralize things as I go along. So this is cadmium yellow pale and that's that. Oh this is Chinese white up here. Set that guy right there. And it's probably hard to see a little bit. Maybe I can hold it up a little bit closer. This is cadmium yellow medium. And most of these are Winsor Newton. Um, this one here is yellow ochre. I'll provide a list down below of what these paints are. You don't have to get them all, but they're just ones that I like and prefer. This is cadmium red. And then I have some cadmium red deep. Little diff bit different shades. This is burnt umber. Put that guy right there. This, no, this, that oh, burnt umber goes there. Burnt sienna is right next to it. That's burnt sienna. Okay. And then these two at the end are my reds that are cooler, more rosy tones. So this is rose matter hue. And this is a lizard and crimson right there. Okay. And then on this side, I have my blues and greens and purples. 
So I've got most of my warms there on this. These are all warm. And then as I start to venture this way, I have my reds that are cool. So I'm kind of pointing in the direction of my cool tones. Kind of like my, my regular oil painting palette, I try to keep it organized that way. All right, so let's get into my cool side. This one down here is Viridian Green. The one next to it is Emerald. This one is Cerulean Blue, and that is a really, really strong color. And then um, this is Cobalt Blue. The next one over is Ultramarine Blue, and I use that one pretty much all the time. This one is Indigo, and I love that. It's like a midnight blue. This one is Dioxinine Purple. Then I've got Ivory Black, and I don't actually have any more Ivory Black. That was the last of it, so I don't have the tube anymore. And then this was Turquoise, and I just wanted some of these fun colors like Turquoise and Emerald because I will be going to some more tropical locations next summer, and so I wanted some tropical colors. <laughs> All right, oh, and raw sienna. I put a little raw sienna in with my yellow ochre. I probably shouldn't have, but there it is. All right, so get these out of the way. Now, that is my watercolor. I'm going to set my palette over here, and I like this plastic. Some people paint on metal or glass or whatever. I just like this one because it's easy to throw in my backpack, and, you know, if it breaks, I'll feel bad, but it's, it's whatever. It's fine. And I like the little thumb hole if I want to be standing and put my brushes here in the little holders like that. You can do that, too, if you want. I like the size, too. I sure don't need a great big thing. All right, so for my waters, I have two waters and I use different glasses for these because one is gonna be for cleaning my brushes and the other one is going to be for actually mixing in with my paints. And the challenge is to keep that sorted out. I have in this glass here soaking my natural sponge and I like to get it um, kind of ready to go. I wring it out really, really well. If, if you just start using this while you're painting dry, Paint doesn't like to um, de absorb, so if it's a little wet, then it works better. And so I guess that one's going to be for cleaning brushes, and this one will be for actually painting with. And then, um, okay, so this is my inkwell, and we'll get into all this. This is where I keep my ink in my little holder, obviously. You can buy, I like Higgins black ink. I like it, but you have to add water to thin it down because it's, it doesn't want to flow out of the pen tip as well as I'd like. So experiment with how much water to add that's comfort comfortable for you. I have this cute little bottle of calligraphy ink, and you can use that too. Um, this is an antique inkwell. I found it in an antique store. Love it. Of course, I've got a fun pen here, dipping pen. I really like this pen tip that it came with. It comes with other pen tip nibs. These just slide in and off. They're interchangeable. And the other ones have different sizes and will draw a different line. And maybe in another video I'll do more on pen and inking and why that's significant. Okay. So you can buy all sorts of different sizes and things for those. I'll move that out of the way. And I think that we are all set. I have a little bit of salt here. I'm going to show you a little bit of technique with that. Now I already have my images taped down to a board, but when you're painting, You'll want to use some artist tape and tape it around the borders to get it ready for painting. Okay. All right, so getting going on this, I want to show you how I do my washes. So washes are the key to Victorian watercolor painting. Mastering the wash will give you an, an, a higher quality uh, painting. So I have my, I taped this paper to a board and I just have it sitting up a little bit. It's at a slight angle. So I'm gonna get my brush wet and I do wanna use the sable one for this. I'm just gonna grab some ultramarine blue since it's really easy to see. Um, oops, first thing you do when you sit down to paint is you wake up your colors. Didn't know they were sleeping, did ya? <laughs> So I put a little bit of water on each one because I don't know which ones I'm going to use. I say, wake up, wake up everybody. And this just makes it so that as you're going along, um, you know that as you dip into the different colors that they're going to be fresh. 
and ready for you. So I began with a lot of water on my brush and grabbed some pigment. We're taking ultramarine blue. I'm using that again, like I said, just because it's vibrant and easy to see on camera. Okay, so now when you load up your brush, you can see that there is a lot of paint in there. Do you see how the, the color there is um, nice and juicy? If I were to hold it vertical, you'd see all the water and paint come down to the end. So I have a grid made in, on this paper with tape. And to do a wash, I start at the top, drag my brush across. Now there's a puddle there. All I'm gonna do with my brush now is drag that puddle down. And you have to have your paper angled. This is the number one thing I see people forgetting. Hold your paper up just a little bit. Even if you're just working on a block of paper and you're just doing it on your lap, hold it up. Now remember, we woke up the sponge, so I'm wiping my brush off. You can oops, clean it off, wipe it off, and then now we're going to come over here and suck up this puddle. Okay, that puddle is gone. It came back up into the dryish bristles of my brush, and now the rest of that pigment is just kind of filling in that area. All right, let's do another one. I'm going to grab a different color just so you can see. I'll take this emerald. I haven't used this yet. Let's put some turquoise in that. <laughs> it looks like the green that comes in the praying watercolors. I don't, when I recommend that people buy those, um, I recommend you only use the um, primary colors. But you can use that green to neutralize other colors, which is why I have it. By itself though it's kind of atrocious okay so I added some turquoise to that and you can see and I like to keep a nice big juicy puddle going here this is very loaded over here draw your line across the top of the square and drag it down see that puddle nice full puddle problems that happen with washes they can be too dry and so you're not really moving the puddle but you're kind of scratching coloring like a color cramp you don't want to do that. Dry your brush off and suck up that puddle. See how those are nice and flat? You don't see any um, scratches. You don't see um, going back, oh, I missed a spot and all that. There's things you can do wrong, like laying your brush this way and scraping the puddle that way. You don't want to do that. So just use the tip to dry it off. I'm going to try to flatten that out again. But you don't want to keep uh, overworking an area. If you want something really dark, you let that layer dry and then you come back over it. So let's make that blue a little darker. So I'm going to make another batch of ultramarine blue here. And to make a color lighter or darker in watercolor, it's simply a matter of um, how much water you add. More water will lighten it. Less water will make a darker shade. Dragging the puddle down. Clean your brush off, dry it off, and just use the tip and suck up that puddle. Okay? I've got one more square down here I'll do since we're right here. Let's take some alizarin crimson because it's pretty. Lots of water, lots of paint. Remember if you use a lot of water, it's going to be very, very light, so maybe you don't want too much water, but you got to have enough to make a puddle. Okay, so line at the top, like that, drag the puddle down. Clean the brush off, dry the brush off, and let the water just kind of flow down into that area where that lighter went. If your paper's at an angle, it'll flow downhill. Okay, so you want to make sure it's always at an angle. Now, um, I'm going to come over to this side and talk about bringing puddles down and around because what that is something that you're going to have to do. You can't just always do squares. So, grabbing a little paint onto my palette. Um, Let's put some yellow into this green and see what happens. That's pretty, the blue. Okay, so starting here. So let's say you've got some trees. We're gonna be painting trees today. 
dragging the puddle down. Like so. Okay, you still have a puddle even though it's in abstract shape. We'll just go right over some other things. Why not? So leaving some gaps that are white help give it freshness and feeling. Now I got all the way down to the bottom because I'm using my nice sable. If you were using a synthetic, you probably would have got halfway and had to go get more paint. So that's the reason for nice expensive brushes. And that's okay, but remember with watercolor it's a timing thing. It'll start to dry on you. So if you go back up and you try to add more color and stuff in here, um, and it's starting to dry, you're gonna lose some of that interesting effect that we're looking for. So let's get going on our project and I can talk more about fun effects on that. And composing a painting and layering. Okay, so we got this little tiny canvas. I say canvas because I'm used to painting on canvas. This is a four by six. And again, you can buy these postcard um, little things, do the painting on it and uh, send it out to your loved ones. You can buy these for all of your Christmas list people if you want. Okay, so something you want to bear in mind when you're watercolor painting is when you draw your painting onto the paper, only use like a H, a 4H pencil or, or something very light. If you go too dark with your pencil lead, when you go to paint, you'll smear graphite around. Um, and so that's no fun. <laughs> so I'm gonna, uh, you won't be able to see much of this because I'm gonna hold this down low so I can actually paint on it. But that is the design and I will give you uh, a copy of this drawing. Getting going on this. Now, when I plan in a painting, I always try to work from the lightest to the darkest. And that's often the furthest away to the foreground. I know that this is gonna be a lot of snow in here. There's gonna be a lot that's left white. What I like to do is to just mentally picture it in my head, what I want the finished painting to look like. And so knowing that the trees are gonna be dark um, green, they're gonna progress back to lighter. So these are gonna be just a light, soft forest green. And then this is a frozen river. So I'm gonna paint some darker patches of um, kind of brown blue in there. So, and then at the end, I'm gonna do uh, salt and, um, a little bit of snow splatterings and we'll play with some of that. So let's get going. I always try to uh, get my colors ready before I start the actual painting process. I don't have to do all my colors, but I do have to do the ones that are gonna be a big wash. So I mean, this is kind of a small paper, but if it was bigger, um, I would definitely need to make a very good sized puddle. So this is going to be a snowy scene, so I know that my sky is not going to be beautiful blue, but we're going to give it a little bit of blue, and we're going to make it slightly gray. I like to neutralize colors with their complements, and the complement of blue is orange, but I like to use brown because it's still part of the orange family, so that's a little burnt sienna. Mix it in with the blue, and it gives you a really nice kind of cloudy gray sky day. I want that a little bit darker so that I can adjust the light as I need it. So I'll start out too dark, oops, start it too dark, and then you can add more water if you need it lighter. It's more difficult while you're painting to stop what you're doing, mix it darker if you need it darker. All right, so I'm leaving that now, getting the clear water to paint with, and I'm gonna do water over the whole thing. Now, the easiest way to do a wash is in a, um, if you're gonna go just down with water, turn your paper vertical. And if you have a long stretch here of sky or color that you are gonna be adding, just turn it vertical. There's nothing that says you can't do that. It's more difficult to get a flat wash going across a long rectangle, and it's e easier this way. So let's just do clear over the whole thing. It's so little, this brush will be just fine for this. And I run water over the whole paper it kind of wakes it up a little bit too, just like I did with my sponge. And um, also it makes it so that when I put the next layer of pigment on it, it, it already has somewhere to go. It's kind of got that nice prepped surface. So I don't want it super, super runny, just a little bit. So I'm gonna take my gray-blue color here, 
and turning it vertical because it's easier to go that route. I'm just going to put this around the trees a little bit. It may blur a little and that's okay. I want it to because then it'll give me the illusion of a soft um, sky. And I'm not going to color the whole sky in. Let's leave some to look like um, clouds maybe. Oh, those are trees back there. I like to make the clouds a little bit um, bigger at the top of the page because it makes it look like it's coming out at us more. So let's turn it this way and just see what we've got. I like it a little darker towards the horizon over there because sometimes you see sort of that layered stratosphere like clouds get layered over there. Now that looks like a winter sky. I'm going to put a little bit more blue into that and while it's all still wet I'm going to add the shadows into the snow. So let's get figure out where these are going to go. This is a nice heavily snowed meadow and I'm using just the tip of my brush thinking about where I want the paper left white. Okay, so just uh, thinking about the shadows under the trees back here, giving it a little, it's not really, it's not, uh, they're not gonna be bright, strong shadows because we don't have a lot of sun in this painting. So they're just gonna be soft blue to give us some texture and dimension to the snow. All the time I'm thinking about what I'm going to leave the white of the paper. So if you make it a little bit too dark, clean your brush off, dry it off, and try to suck up that puddle a little bit. And that's why I keep a shorter, stubbier, synthetic brush around. You can sort of rub out a little bit and erase some of that. Just a little. You don't want to go crazy rubbing too much because then it'll the whole thing will just look rubbed out. So you don't want that. So here we go down around the banks of the river and on this side. You notice too, I, there's not really a lot of puddle movement going on because the, the color is so light and there's so little that I'm working with and moving around. So um, it's not really, there's not really the puddle that I'm dragging. So this, this I wouldn't say is 100% Victorian watercolor, but it gives you the idea and um, it's more or less the same thing. <laughs> Just regular painting. We enjoy it. Okay, so you can kind of start to see where that is going. Sorry about the glare. It seems that it's just kind of inevitable with wet paint. It gets glossy, so I'm trying to maneuver that. Okay, so I've got my little river here and I know that it's not solid white, so I'm going to start to layer in the color, the same blue gray, into the river. Just get some of that going. I'm going to be painting over this for the most part, but it gives us that first layer of paint. Okay, so that's in there. Remember to leave some white. Okay, so now um, I'm going to be painting the trees. This is mostly dry. You can use a blow dryer to dry it if you're impatient, and that's okay too. Um, I don't have one, and it's so little that I figured I'm just not going to worry about it. So I'm adding a little bit of yellow ochre to this turquoise mixture I had. Um, I want it to be a little bit more bluer though. I wanted to establish a green, but because these are so far away, I don't want them so warm yellow ochre trees. So I'm adding more blue to this. And, but it still gives us a cool tone of pine green. And you can always test these colors on a, the scratch paper or the back of your paper if you want. So I'm going to come back in here now and add these far away distant trees. And here I'm going to turn my paper vertical and do these um, little wash, just a little wash like this. You can see the puddle I'm dragging down. And they got to be pointy. These are pine trees. 
and bring this over here. You can see I'm dragging the puddle around. And I'm gonna go around the ones in front because the ones in front have some um, snow on them. And so I wanna go around those white spots. I don't want those to be painted green underneath. So there's a little bit of mental planning you have to do and that, that remember I said that visual, have a, uh, an idea of what you want the painting to look like when you're done. So I wipe my brush off and I suck up those extra puddles. Okay, and here we go, like this. Um, there's, I think I've missed a few over here. Now, I'm gonna add a little bit of, a little bit darker tone to that, of green. And as the trees get closer to us, we're gonna make them richer, darker, more vibrant. Ultramarine blue, yellow ochre, I try to clean my brush in between jumping back and forth to the different colors because you don't want to contaminate your wells of your colors. So I've got ultramarine blue, and you don't want to go too dark. Don't go too dark yet. That's a pretty pine green color. All right, so these are getting closer. Now I'm going to go around some white spots, and it's okay if you um, end up filling them in a little. It's whatever. They're just hypothetical. You can always add them later by you can rub out some snow and I'll show you how to do that. I'm just kind of filling in the tree. Now this is not the first, this is only the first layer on these trees. Um, so I will add a little bit more darker dimension to the trees as we go along. But for now, you can see how dark that puddle looked over there. And when you start painting with it, it gets lighter because you're dragging that puddle down. It's always the color that's underneath the puddle that gives you the actual color. So don't just trust your um, puddle that you see on your palette. You've got to test it to see exactly what that is. So I'm going to grab this tree. I'm going to make this one the same color because, let's face it, these two are buddies. And they're right next to each other, so that's okay. Pull that down. And I'll, I'll probably make the one in front here a little bit richer, darker. I'll add some darker accents to that. Okay, come over here. Got a little tree over here. Leaving some spots white. I like that it's sort of blending a teeny bit with the stuff in the background, those trees back there, because it softens that edge, and I really don't want anything really sharp, sharp edge in these paintings. You don't have to leave any white gaps in your pine trees if you don't want to. Maybe you don't want to paint a snowy scene, but you want to paint a summer scene. You can take this meadow and very, very simply turn this into not a winter scene, but um, a summer scene. You can put flowers down here and paint this all green, different shades of green. Remember, green, as it gets closer to us, gets more vibrant and alive, richer, darker. Everything that's near us is more. Everything that's far away is less. I'm going to give this a little bit more shadow under there and soften that edge. Okay, now we've got this big guy right here. So I need that to be much darker. And the colors that I showed you that I have on my palette, I'm certainly not going to use for this whole painting. They're just what I have here. and um, But you can see the essential ones that I am using for this demonstration. All right, so that's yellow ochre and ultramarine blue. And I'm going to try to go around these white patches as much as possible. I don't want them to look like bingo pot patches or something, <laughs> just like da, 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 even squares and so forth. So I kind of want to make them like little potatoes or piles of snow or whatever. And watch your branches on your tree that they don't get too stair-stepped because it's very easy to make it too perfect. So you just got to watch that. So 
So you can see I'm still dragging this puddle down. That Essentially, that's all I'm doing with this big tree, just dragging that puddle down. parts where the tree touches the snow, I want that to be really soft. So cleaning my brush off, wiping it off on the sponge, and it's kind of weird and bent, but who cares. Coming in here with the dry tip, and I can soften that edge as long as it's still wet and hasn't dried. If it's dry, you may have to come in with your stubby brush and kind of soften and smooth that out. Okay, so let's grab, we're gonna get this little river done. So I'm taking some in my new palette over here as well. Ultramarine blue. Oops, I was using indigo. That's okay. Ultramarine blue is just as well. Indigo, it's fine. Let's make this a nice, rich, dark for the river. Just to really make it look frozen. And it also adds that compositional element too that we the painting needs. So it'll guide us back into the background. All right, so wear that dark, and remember, it's not as dark as the puddle looks. We're going to work our way back, way back there. And I don't want to paint over the shine that I gave the frozen river either, so we'll just kind of go around that. Just make this go all the way, nice dark patch over there. I have some puddles here that I kind of want to um, soak up. I don't want them to be too bright and dark. So I'm going to clean my brush off really well. I'll take the stubby one here because I really want to soften where the snow comes down to the water. Just a little, just to really make it have the illusion of softness. Like that. Look at how, look how easy that makes that look like it's snow touching the water. Let's clean this edge up too, just while it's still wet. Otherwise, if it's dry, it's a whole different story. Okay, give it a little bit more dimension back in here. You can add more, um, more layers and so forth as you're going along. But remember, it's not going to have the illusion of depth if the colors and values are the same way back there as they are up here. So always make sure that what you have going on back here is quiet, soft, fuzzy, subdued. It'll really make it look atmospheric. Let's bring our river back here to these trees. Okay, now all I wanted to do is a little bit more dimension on these, this tree here, and then I will show you uh, a little bit more of what you can do. And I'm just using the same brush I was using to rub out it's okay just to grab it and work with it. And so I'm not covering over the entire tree either. I'm just letting some of the dark patches show through. And let's make this a little darker in some of these areas over here. That gives that a little bit more dimension. All the time thinking about the way trees look and how their branches hang and their nature. Spend, spend time out in nature and really observe and get up close and go for your nature hikes in the woods. And There's nothing like it when the snow is falling to be out there in the silence. So I'm adding a little bit of blue to these little piles of snow just, just to give it some little bit of depth there. Okay, now um, I, the, it's too dry to do the salt, um, unfortunately. So, but what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna put a little bit of acrylic paint on my palette, but I'm gonna wipe it up when I'm done. If you leave the acrylic paint on your palette, it will um, cause a problem. <laughs> okay, so what I'm gonna do, it'll dry on there and you can't get it off, is with a clean brush, I just grabbed one of these, kind of a junk brush, I'm gonna come on here and just like this onto my painting and it's not coming off. If you don't have it wet enough, it won't do the snowy thing. So 
we're going to splatter like this. Here we go, getting some action. And that's really pretty if you can see that. Get a little bit more in there. I love doing this. I think it's so pretty. It, it kind of just blends in to the, um, the paint a little bit and softens everything. And you've created a very quiet, snowy scene in winter. So if you enjoy Victorian watercolor, check out my workshop down below. I'm going to put a post. Check out my workshop in England. I think you're going to really enjoy it. Oops, that's too big of a clock. You can just go like that. All right. Okay, so I had mentioned um, demonstrating a little bit of how I do my pen and ink. I, like I said, I don't prefer to use the ink as much. So I'm going to take um, just a, whatever color I want. And I usually go with something that is similar to what I'm going to do on here. So I'll just take this darker color, maybe a little bit more blue. And I wouldn't really ink something like this, but I'm just going to show you what I would do. And I'll do a little bit down here. So with this teeny, teeny brush coming in here along the snowbank, and I just sort of draw in, almost like it would be the ink, some of these features where I would have my inking instead. So you can see, I just draw a few like that. And that is, that is all there is to the what I do with the inking. Like that. Maybe just a little bit more definition back there. But it's a snowy, misty scene, so I'm not going to go too crazy on this. Maybe just kind of give that illusion of ice a little bit more. And then to sign it, I usually just sign my watercolors with pencil. You can use your pen and ink if that's what you're going to do. And again, um, with all of my watercolors, I just keep them with a light pencil. This is a 2H. So this seems like a good place to sign it, so I'm just going to put it down in here. Okay. And of course, it's if it's a card, if you want to, you know, handwrite, Merry Christmas or whatever. You can do that. All right, so there is the finished work. Okay, so if you enjoyed this one, don't forget to subscribe. And um, remember, on the 7th, 21st, and the 28th of December, giveaways. Follow me on Facebook or uh, here, or join our Renaissance community. Um, you guys. Uh, I'm going to do drawings in all of those different places, so definitely you want to be on board for that. Comment in the section below on those videos. You can comment on this one. I love your comments, and I do try to get at them right away. Sometimes it takes me a few weeks, but <laughs> I do get at them, and I love them, and I'm here to answer any questions and help and support. Um, I think that we're all in this together, and I really appreciate you guys. So join the community, and um, I'll draw a name, and hopefully you're it. Okay, guys, have a wonderful day, and um, see you next week.